so fancy. Never, never had anything like this. So I want uh, to talk to you about, I want to talk to you about the last decade or so of Rails. Uh, but before we do that, uh, my name is Jason. This is what I look like on an iPhone. Uh, I flew here from Memphis. Uh, if you're not familiar with Memphis, it's the home of Elvis Presley, uh, the NBA's Memphis Grizzlies, and the world's only Bass Pro Shop that's inside a pyramid. And if you don't know what a Bass Pro Shop is, then just keep living your life. And if you do, you probably have a lot of questions that I'd be glad to answer. Uh, by day, I work for a company called Podia. I've been at Podia five years. Uh, I'm a staff product developer there, and so I write a lot of Rails. I help my coworkers fix a lot of my Rails. And uh, yeah, I'm really grateful uh, to work at Podia. They help me come speak at conferences like this. And if you want to learn more about Podia, that's the domain. For the past five years, uh, I've been co-hosting a podcast called Remote Ruby, and I'm going to do something I've never done before, but I would ask you, how many people have listened to an episode of Remote Ruby? It's pretty, that's pretty wild. Um, this conference is also pretty special for me because it's the first time my wife has seen one of my talks in seven years. Uh, but actually what I figured out is this just an excuse for her to see an Aaron Patterson keynote after my talk. <laughs> And along those lines, I want to be very vulnerable with you today, and I want to show you a very artistic side of myself uh, that, no offense to my wife, that she just doesn't understand, but I think as a community you will appreciate, uh, and that's how artistic I am. And I spilled my name with mustard on a hot dog, and this took me like 10 minutes, and I just need somebody to appreciate this. That's the end of my talk. No, this is, a, this is my first time in Europe, which is like a lifelong dream, so I'm really glad for this opportunity. Uh, I've been struggling a little bit though because I've been telling people I've been coming to Amsterdam, and they've been telling me about this awesome traffic light museum, and I cannot find it. So if anyone can tell me where the traffic light museum is, they call it the Red District, come find me afterwards. So, uh, for the rest of my time, I want to talk to you about a framework that's loved by so many people, a framework that's really solidified itself uh, as one of the best and continues to innovate. So today I want to... <laughs> today I want to talk to you about Rails. So it's been like, a full two days of technical talks, uh, all kinds of just excitement around Rails. And so like I said at the beginning, I wanna kinda of zoom out and I wanna talk about the last 10 or 15 years of Rails and kinda of where we are today. So I was late to Ruby on Rails, considerably I guess. Uh, Rails was already eight years old by the time I even knew what web development really was. And I actually treat tech years as dog years. So by the time that I learned Ruby on Rails, it was already 63 years old. And my first impression of it was that it was revolutionary. I didn't have any real world experience, but it felt revolutionary. Revolutionary for a kid studying computer science in college. A kid with no vision of really what he wanted to do with his life. Revolutionary for a kid who thought this was the only way to build web applications. <laughs> because Rails empowered me. I learned HTML and CSS a few years earlier, but I'd always wanted to write server code, but I just felt like it was out of my reach. Like, that was too smart for me. And Rails actually made me believe that building web applications was within my reach, something that I could actually do. It also showed me that it was a lot of fun to build web applications. I experienced an actual joy running Rails new. I loved, and I, I still love to this day, letting Rails handle database connections and schemas and all that for me. I actually was smiling the first time I ran a scaffold command because all of a sudden this little concept had come to life from just a few, a few keystrokes. 
And at that point, I was hooked. It sounds cliche, but Ruby on Rails really did change my life. It gave me confidence to go all in and become a software developer. Within just two years, I went from selling musical instruments to getting paid full time to work on real world code in a real world Ruby on Rails code base. And it's afforded me a ton of other opportunities, friends, a career, and even this chance right now to hang out with all of you. So yeah, I think Rails was revolutionary, but it wasn't just revolutionary for me. It was revolutionary, I think, for an entire industry. Now, I can't speak firsthand to what web development was like in 2003, and I'm sure several people in this room could come up and tell me after, but just from doing my very scientific Googling, I get a vibe about building web applications in the early 2000s, and that, that it wasn't much fun. It seems like there was a lot of work to do just to stand something up, and people seemed really unhappy about that. There's a lot of complaints online about Java, Enterprise Java, and .NET from that time period. In fact, here's some real quotes I found about uh, Rails when it was released. Things like, Rails is a powerhouse. Rails is one of those economy-changing tools. Do not look at Rails if you have to do .NET. Two hours later, my .NET career was over. And this person who set out to prove the Rails folks wrong, now I'm one of them. Or you can take this quote about a healthcare company in the early 2000s, switching from enterprise Java to Ruby on Rails. They replaced a Java uh, Enterprise Edition solution that wasn't moving the team forward fast enough. And the result? A 20 to one reduction in the amount of code needed to solve the problem. So yes, Rails was revolutionary. Not everyone found Rails evolutionary though. The early days also seemed to bring some controversy. And I'm not really sure why anyone would find Ruby on Rails controversial. <laughs> Some people just didn't share our love of the framework. You can find a decent amount of this criticism online as well. Things like, Rails is way overhyped. Anyone knows that a CRUD framework just doesn't cut it. Mapping web UI directly to the database never scales. Or simply, it's horrible. <coughs> There's also this banger of a quote. Anyone who tries to convince you that Rails is in some way an elegant and consistent way to create web applications is entirely insane. But between the hype and the noise, Rails continued to grow. Small, unheard of startups were building their businesses using Rails. Companies that paved the way for the slogan on the landing page, Ruby on Rails scales from hello world to IPO. And it continued to get better. They didn't just release Rails 1.0 and move on. No, they continued to innovate. One of my favorite stories, I wasn't around then, was when they merged with Merb, a Ruby, a Ruby web framework that uh, was also very popular at the time. And from my understanding, this actually laid the foundation for a lot of the Rails that I know and love today. And before you know it, well, Rails was stable. It had solidified its place into web development. The hard problems were solved and people were building and running businesses successfully on the rails. We were writing our backends with Ruby, our frontends with HTML, unobtrusive JavaScript for enhancement. We had jQuery for interactivity. We were using CoffeeScript instead of ES5, which Andrew Mason still wants to use CoffeeScript. And we were building API endpoints with JBuilder. And best of all, we didn't have to test anymore. TDD was dead. But another name you hear for stable technology is boring technology. And by all accounts, at that time, Rails was boring. And depending on how you looked at it, this was a good thing. We were free to ride the waves of Ruby on Rails' success, getting paid to build software quickly, and we were having fun while doing it. Until JavaScript took over. And it got very popular. All around us, new applications, libraries, and tools were being built with JavaScript. We saw a rise in single page applications as the one true way to build a website or a web app. Countless libraries moved to the Node Package Manager, and new build tooling was popping up everywhere. We saw huge tech corporations invest all kinds of time and money into making JavaScript just a faster and better language. ES6 really started to take shape. It made massive improvements to the JavaScript language. Many of the features that I personally love in CoffeeScript actually found their way into JavaScript eventually making CoffeeScript obsolete. 
And all of a sudden, it felt like JavaScript was eating the world. It was the future. Everything was built in it. And plus, JavaScript made promises that not a lot of, a lot of other languages could make. Like the promise of Node. Why would you write Ruby when you could build your front end and back end in the same language? Why would you write Ruby when Node is so much faster than old horse and buggy Ruby? And a common theme from developers during that time was, well, that whole ecosystem was kind of exhausting. But also, it was kind of a bummer, because for the first time, Rails was outdated. It was the old guard. And it wasn't just that JavaScript was popular. It's that people couldn't stop talking about JavaScript. They were excited about this new era of web development. They were tweeting, writing blog posts, blowing up Hacker News. It was everywhere. And though the noise was loud, Rails was still adapting to this new era of web development. In 2015, we saw Rails ship in API-only mode, a flavor of Rails without sprockets and any kind of front-end tooling. Useful for those of us who want to build some type of web app uh, using Ruby on the server, but don't want to build our client using Rails, using a... Uh, you know, the JavaScript library. And for those of us still building full stack web applications in Rails, we saw the introduction of Webpacker. Webpacker was a Rails-like wrapper for Webpack. Now, this slide may be triggering for some of you, uh, but even though this was somewhat controversial, it was exciting because it meant we could actually start embracing modern JavaScript tooling. We could use NPM, we could take advantage of ES6 features that browsers didn't support yet. And for some people, some people, it meant they could unit test JavaScript. And even though it came with complexity, I just, I believe this was what we needed at the time. And it wasn't just Rails uh, adapting. This package right here, React Rails, lives under the React.js repo uh, on GitHub. This package actually allows you to use React components, almost like first-party citizens in Rails. And we, we use this at Podia today. We have, please don't hurt me after, we have some React at Podia. And this package has been a dream. And on that subject, I would hate it if I didn't take a second to thank Justin Gordon at Shaka Code, because I think many of us, whether we realize it or not, have benefited from the different libraries and articles that helped bridge us, bridge the gap for us during this time. In fact, actually, when Webpacker was deprecated, uh, Justin took it on as Shockapacker. So, is it fair to say that Rails could adapt enough to remain relevant in this new era? Not according to a lot of people outside of our community. They had seen the future, and they declared that it was done. We were done building apps on Rails. It was too old school to adapt to how we build applications now. But through all of this, Rails kept going. Some people ignored the noise. Some people let the noise bring fear, uncertainty, and doubt. And I was one of them. I loved writing Ruby and Rails. It's the only framework I had used professionally and I was concerned that I was going to have to switch to writing something that I would have to learn all over again and that actually I just wasn't even passionate about. I really hope that that wasn't the case. But you know what? Time went on, life went on, and Rails went on. And it didn't die. In fact, Rails continued to release new versions. Uh, people kept launching new Rails applications. It was far from dead. It was just noise. And in fact, there's been a little bit of a shift. Over time, certain tools actually weren't able to live up to some of the hype and some of the things that they had promised. Now, that's not all of them. A lot of them did fill, fill gaps for people. But like any technology, the cons can outweigh the pros. And in fact, we actually started to see people missing Rails, or at least missing the Rails-like experience. For some people, the, the, this meant that they missed the old way of doing things, rendering HTML from a server, dropping a little bit of JavaScript in there for interactivity, something that, well, as we all know, Ruby and Rails is very good at. For other people, this didn't mean returning to this pre-JavaScript revolution, but it did mean they missed the productivity they had with Rails. I've seen, and I've personally spent, a lot of time gluing libraries together to build functionality that I get for cheap or even free in Rails. One of my favorite blog posts actually describing this feeling came out in 2019. It's literally titled, 
why I miss Rails. And in this post, the author specifically talks about missing that productivity. They say, I'm not suggesting that we give up React and ES7 and go back to writing server, template, server templated web apps like it's 2012 again. However, I do think in the transition to the modern web stack, something like React, Node, GraphQL, we've unsolved some of what tools like Rails made easy 10 years ago. And I don't think it needs to be this way. This author goes on to describe some pain points specifically. There's no longer a standardized way to get user accounts with a login or sign up, forgot password, or email confirmation flow, despite every application needing it. So instead, we need to spend days rewriting this functionality anew on each project. They compare this to using something like device in Rails. Want to allow users to upload avatar images? Spend a day writing an image upload, resize, push to S3 flow from scratch, which in 2019 they compared to Paperclip, which most, a lot of us now use active storage. Want to add a search engine? Great, spend a day writing the code to index and search your documents from scratch. Compare this to using uh, some type of drop-in gem for either Elasticsearch or like PG Search in Rails. Need to add Google login? Get ready to spend another day on that as compared to using OmniAuth in Rails. They go on to summarize by saying that all these things that used to be easy in Rails take a fair bit of manual effort today because there's not a standardized setup and ecosystem. We're spending a lot of time resolving all these boilerplate issues that every web app needs and everyone has already solved countless times before. I think the majority of the problem is just a result of fragmentation in the modern ecosystem. It is no longer possible to make libraries that automatically handle all the glue code of integration into our apps because there's no standard setup at all anymore. The author concludes by saying that they wish for something like Rails in the JavaScript ecosystem, which isn't really necessarily the point of my talk today. But for others, Rails itself was what they were looking for. The JavaScript revolution is old enough that there's actually plenty of developers that got their start in this ecosystem and have never used or even heard of a framework like Rails. That blog post I just referenced, well, you'll be surprised to learn it was on Hacker News in 2019. And I wanna highlight one of my favorite comments from it. This person actually came to Rails from Node. I came to Rails from Node and I am thoroughly convinced the author is correct. I couldn't estimate my first few months of the job because Rails makes things that would have taken at least twice as long, easy to do, even without gems. Plus, I've seen only a third of the compatibility issues between our version of the framework and up-to-date gems as I saw while I was writing Node full-time. Rails is the first non-enterprise framework I felt that lets me focus on the correct level of concerns for my current needs. And up until this point, I've been referring to everything in past tense. Rails was this, Rails was that. But now, let's fast forward and let's take a look at today at what Rails is or is doing. Well, I think Rails is innovating. Around the, time, around the end of 2020, we started to see fresh ideas and excitement in Rails. Look at all the talks we've heard just in the last few days around Hotwire itself. An elegant, server-rendered answer to complex JavaScript front-ends a first-class citizen of our ecosystem. The announcement of Hotwire in 2020, I think, brought a much-needed excitement to this community. Rails bid farewell to Webpacker in favor of two first-party packages, JS bundling and CSS bundling. Instead of, have a, instead of having an opinionated uh, tool about which asset building tool we should use, Rails said, you know what, use whatever you want, we'll take the output and we will serve it through. And actually, to be honest, this may not seem like a big deal, but this is one of my favorite changes that's happened in the last five years in Rails. It's actually enabled so many new features uh, in terms of client-side stuff. And do you know what the current trend in client-side applications seems to be? Server-side rendering. Now, obviously this isn't a new innovation for us, but who knew this would be considered innovative 20 years later? The other day I installed the latest version of Next.js and it was actually breaking because it wanted me to server render everything and I had to explicitly say, no, I need to client side render this. So how about that? We are hipsters. <laughs> Rails 7.1 dropped yesterday with just a host of goodies. There's plenty of talks. There's great blog posts on some of that. And you know, all this to say that, well, Rails is exciting. It's fun. This conference sold out in 45 minutes, 45. 
I ran a small conference in Memphis, or no, in Nashville, somewhere. I just put on a conference somewhere. I couldn't even get 45 people to sign up in like two weeks. This is amazing. So Rails feels alive. The is it dead chatter really doesn't happen that much, at least not that I see. It feels like we're pressing forward. But the thing is, well, Rails never died. Ruby on Rails has been pressing forward. Some pushes bigger than others, but they've been consistent. We've mostly gotten new versions consistently. And honestly, I think we owe a tremendous gratitude to the Rails core team and everyone who contributes to this project. Because the Rails core team kept going. While this noise was happening, they tuned it out and they pushed things forward. And you know what? We keep going. And to keep pushing up a big tent, well, I think there's some things we need to do. So on Rails' 20th birthday, what can we do to play our part in keeping the excitement and joy in the Rails ecosystem? Well, the simplest thing I think we can do is just to continue to use the tools we love. If we love Rails, let's keep using Rails. Let's build our side projects in it. Let's test ideas in it. Have fun with Rails. But also, let's explore some other technologies. There's a multitude of wonderful ideas in other ecosystems. Explore them, learn about them, and then, hey, if it's right, maybe let's try and bring it back into Rails. Speaking of exploring other technologies, I'm going to specifically mention something that very much bothers me. And that's how good the React ecosystem is at building front ends. Now, I'm not talking about just building, I'm talking tons of libraries that just are, make it so easy to drop into a project and have accessible, beautiful looking front ends. Sometimes it feels like we have to reinvent the wheel on that stuff, but I don't think it has to be that way. So I'm making a very selfish plea today, and that's for the love of God, please someone build some component libraries. I will pay quality money for something like that. Quality money? I will pay money for quality like that. You get me. We can also help make it easier to build Rails applications, whether it's in the form of building gems, fixing bugs, or even contributing new features to Rails. It feels like there's plenty of room for all of us. And also maybe let's challenge the status quo. I mean, let's look at how often things change in web development. Nothing's really set in stone. Think about the new solid libraries coming in Rails. They're reevaluating and challenging what has been the norm in our workflows. Now, not every challenge will be successful, but we can't get there without trying. And share your ideas with us. I guarantee whether you're a new Rails developer or you've been doing this 20 years, you have experience that is worth sharing with all of us. And something I've noticed about this community in particular is that everyone who likes Ruby is really hungry about Ruby content. You put something out and people want to read it. They want to consume it. So maybe that's in the form of writing blog posts. Dust off that old blog and start sharing things you find interesting or even new to you in Ruby on Rails. Even if it's been said before, I bet you have a unique way to present it, whether you realize it or not. If you need an example, I have two. This company, anytime I Google any Rails feature, they're like one or two on Google. And it's not that they write these in-depth articles, they just cover little Rails features, like one or two paragraphs, and it's absolutely perfect. They've become a trusted source for me when I Google, I can know, okay, this will actually tell me what I need to know. Another great example, obviously, Evil Martians. They take the opposite approach where they write detailed, high quality, in-depth posts about different tools and technology within our ecosystem. To the point also, anytime I see an Evil Martians post, I know that it's reliable and that I can trust it. So these two examples show you that no matter what your writing style is, there's opportunity for you to write about what excites you in our space. You could also use short form content to share tips and tricks you've learned or are learning. This is still a very popular medium for sharing content. It sounds crazy, but start a podcast. Chris and I started Remote Ruby in 2018, unsure that anyone would listen. Still unsure that anyone does listen. But we've persevered, brought on a third co-host, and are actively still running the podcast today. In fact, a little plug, during the after party, there's a podcast booth in the very back and we'll have an open mic, and anyone who wants to come and sit down and be on the podcast for a couple minutes, come on, maybe this is your chance to break the ice a little bit. I can't tell you how many opportunities the podcast has afforded us to talk to people that I never thought I'd get to talk to, people that I respect and people that I admire. And if you're like me, though, and you feel like you actually don't have anything to share, I urge you to scan this and watch this talk by Aaron Francis at this year's Laracon. It's called Publishing Your Work. 
In which basically he describes that, well, you have something worth sharing and we need to hear it. So no, in the grand scheme of things, I wouldn't call what we're experiencing today a comeback because, well, Rails never left and Rails never died. But if you did want to call it a comeback, let me tell you how scientifically I know that Ruby on Rails is back because, well, Rails is controversial again. Thank you. <laughs>